Wonderful. What a great turnout we have. This is such a wonderful group of people, and I'm so excited for our conversation today. I'm personally excited to hear some of your insight and um, hear about your knowledge on this subject that's obviously so important to so many of the people in this room and around the world. And again, thank you for utilizing your platform to speak to such an important issue. Uh, so the first question we have for you is, as you assess the nation's overall health and <coughs> well-being, uh, you've said that mental health is this generation's number one health crisis. Can you talk about why mental health has become so significant to you as Surgeon General? Oh, absolutely. And, and I'm so glad that we're doing this conversation together. And as was said in your introduction, you have such an inspiring story, uh, not just for the students here, but for all of us. So thank you for being a part of this conversation. And to all of you who, who are here, both online and in person, I, I just want to say how excited I am to be back at ASU. I loved my time here in May. Uh, be, be hanging out with Sun Devils and just learning more about the institution and uh, learning about Forks Up, which I'm now doing everywhere on campus. But it was, it was really incredible to see the kind of community you've built here and to be back here as part of our tour. You know, Emma, the reason to me like, mental health became so important and the reason it's the, at the heart of my agenda as Surgeon General during this term has to do with a couple of things. One, it has to do with what we just went through with COVID over the last few years, which took a serious toll on our mental health and well-being. It created invisible wounds that we don't always see, but which are present and which are impacting how we show up at work and at school and for our families. But even before then, I saw when I was serving as Surgeon General before that there were mental health challenges all across our country that communities were dealing with. People didn't talk very openly about them. Uh, often it was in hushed tones after a talk or a listening you know, session where folks would come up to me and say, hey, you know, I, I'm really having a hard time or my daughter is struggling with depression or my son has an anxiety disorder and I'm not sure what to do. <clears throat> and that stuck with me because it reminded me that we have had a growing problem with mental health in our country for a long time. Uh, one that it's high time we finally address and not just address through more access to treatment, but also that we address through dealing with the root causes uh, of that crisis. There's one last piece of this though, which is my own personal experiences. You know, I, I struggled with my own mental health a lot as a kid. I never talked to anyone about it. I felt a sense of shame. I thought it was my fault. Uh, I thought something was wrong with me, and that's why I was struggling. So even though <clears throat> I knew that my parents loved me unconditionally, and that my sister did too, I never, ever spoke to them about it. You know, there were times when I, my own struggles with loneliness were actually so profound as a kid that I just didn't want to go to school, because I didn't want to walk into the cafeteria one more time and feel like there was no one to sit next to, or be on the playground and feel like there was nobody for me to play with. I was shy, I was introverted, it wasn't always so easy to make friends. But I would sometimes, actually quite often, fake having a stomach ache so my mom wouldn't make me go to school. And I haven't told her this to this day. And uh, I'm hope she, hoping she's not watching this on the live stream. But, <clears throat> but that, you know, as human beings, we will seek to relieve pain right. when we experience it. And what I've learned as a, as a kid, as, a, as later on as an adult, as a doctor, and as Surgeon General is that the pain of physical illness and the pain of mental struggle, they are just as important. One is not more important than the other. We can feel emotional pain just as deeply and as acutely as we feel physical pain. And, and we will, as human beings, look to relieve that. And if what we reach for is something healthy and safe, if we reach for each other, if we reach for a counselor, if we talk to an, a, 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 someone in our life who we trust, then that can help. But if we seek to relieve our pain in other ways, if we, for example, reach uh, for alcohol, if we reach for drugs, if we look to violence as a way to sort of, you know, it's an essential, essentially assert our significance or remind us that we're significant, which is a, is a very common thing that happens, then that can harm us. It could potentially harm the people around us. And these choices aren't so simple. I don't want to make it seem like, you know, it's easy to just choose the safer paths, right, to address this pain. It's not always that easy. If you grew up in an environment where what you saw was people reaching for some of the more harmful tools, 
you may likely reach for that as well. And so sometimes I think we have to just acknowledge that we are products not just of our free will, but of our environment. And it just sometimes is an accident of birth or luck, you know, what kind of environment we're surrounded in. Um, so all of this just to say that when <clears throat> in, in 2020, uh, when President Biden toward the end of that year asked me, well, he was not president yet, but when he was knew he was going to be president, he asked me to come back and serve in this position. Uh, what was on my mind was not only COVID, but it was actually primarily this. It was the deeper toll that COVID has caused. It's the deeper challenge of mental health that we are struggling with for decades as a country. And one that I worry if we do not address, it will compromise not just our health, our mental health, but our physical health, our productivity in the workplace, our cohesion as a society, our performance in school, because our mental health at the end of the day, Emma, is the fuel that allows us to show up in our lives for family, for friends, for community, at work and at school. And if that fuel line is pinched off, or if it's cut off as it is for too many people today, we can't be our best selves and lead our best lives. Exactly, and I heard this really great analogy that um, I think perfectly allowed me to imagine the struggle of mental health, and it's that your, your mental health and your mental well-being can be thought of as a glass jar. And every time something stressful happens, maybe there's an exam coming up or you're experiencing some turmoil in your personal life, a little bit of water is added. And if you deal with those struggles and you deal with those stressors in a healthy way, a little bit of water is taken out of that, that glass jar. But if you are turning to um, unhealthy ways of coping, you're, you're not going to remove any water from that glass jar. And inevitably, it's going to overflow and you're going to experience um, a huge like, burst of, of stress and of anxiety and, and of depression. And I'm sure that that's something that many people in this room have experienced at one point or another in their life. I know personally, I can pinpoint that exact day when I experienced that outburst. And that was when I decided, okay, so I need to find some healthy ways to cope with the, my struggles in my life. And that oftentimes people wait until they experience that, that burst of energy and that overflow before deciding that it's time to seek help, seek professional help, um, talk to their family and friends. And so that's why it's so important what you're doing and why we're so grateful that you're making it a priority to find um, and equip young students with the resources to handle their stress um, so that they don't have to experience that overflow and so that they don't have to get to that point because that point is incredibly detrimental and I think it can really derail a person. I know from personal experience I can say that. Um, so our next question for you is young people are, they're not only suffering but they're also part of the solution. Mm. And we play a crucial role in removing the stigma around mental health. How do you see the role of young people in changing the mindset about mental well-being? Well, I think young people are already doing this when it comes to mental health. Because look, when I was growing up, I remember that that sense of shame that I felt, that was pervasive. Everyone felt that. It was only years later, when I talked to classmates from back then, that I realized that a lot of them were struggling too. We all thought we were the only ones. Mm -hmm. And we never talked about it. But I actually think that it's the younger generation of high school students, college students, recent grads who have the courage to think differently and talk differently and more openly about mental health who are actually pushing older generations to think differently and to be more open. With that said, there is still stigma that surrounds mental illness <clears throat> and with mental health struggles more broadly that prevents people from not just admitting their struggles but even asking for help. Uh, and the good news is that there is increasingly more and more help available. There are more and more mental health services on campuses that are being made available. There's now 988, which is a crisis line that you can call or text and be connected to a trained mental health counselor uh, if you are in crisis. <clears throat> and this is true 24-7, any, any place in the country. So there are resources, but if we don't have the, the comfort to ask for it, if we don't recognize that it's okay to, to, to reach out for help, then we're not going to do it. And that's one of the different uh, shifts that we want to continue to make. But I'll also say that one of the places where all of you can help as students who are listening here today is actually through the power of social connection, which is the, the main reason that we're here on this tour, is because many people don't realize how 
tightly social connection is tied to our mental health and well-being. If you are like me, who was struggling with loneliness as a kid, you probably just thought, man, loneliness is just a bad feeling. I've got to suck it up, get it over with. It's fine. It's actually not the case. It turns out that loneliness has real consequences for our health. When people struggle with the sense of being lonely and isolated, basically being socially disconnected, that actually increases their risk of depression, anxiety, and suicide. It also turns out, over time, increases their risk of physical illness as well. Heart disease, dementia, premature death. In fact, we see that the over overall mortality impact of social disconnection is on par with smoking daily. It's even greater than the mortality impact we see associated with obesity. Right? And we clearly think about smoking and obesity as public health concerns, right? But one of the reasons I issued an advisory on the epidemic of loneliness a few months ago is because loneliness and isolation are just as important public health threats as smoking and obesity. But lastly, we can all do something about it. This is a good thing. You don't have to wait for an act of Congress to address loneliness in your life or the lives of people around you, thank God, because we don't know when that would happen. <clears throat> but what we can do is we can actually do simple things like reaching out and checking on one another. The power of a simple check-in on a friend, texting a friend to say, hey, I'm just thinking about you to see how you're doing. Um, or stopping by a friend's dorm just to say, hey, uh, I was in the area. I was in your building. I just wanted to see what you're up to, if you're doing okay. Or swinging by somebody who might be eating by themselves in the dining hall to say, hey, do you mind if I, do you, you want some company? you mind if I you know, take a seat here and you know, right next to you? These seem like small things, but what you do when you check in on someone is you're not just checking in on them. You're telling them, I see you. You have value. You're not invisible. And that's important in a world where so many people are feeling invisible. And this is one of the reasons I actually am focused on the issue of loneliness in particular, is because in 2015, when I was just beginning my time as Surgeon General back then, I was traveling around the country and hearing from people, including on college campuses, who were telling me they were struggling with loneliness. I remember being in Texas and talking to a group uh, just like this, of hundreds of students. And one after one, they, they came up afterward and they were telling me, you know, I, I'm on this campus with hundreds of other students, but I feel like nobody really knows me. I don't really feel like I can be myself. And that is really important because being connected is not about how many people you're surrounded by. It's about the quality of those connections. You know, I, I know that the world of social media has taught us that quantity matters, right? How many friends you have, how many contacts you have, how many likes are you getting, how many reposts are you getting? Like, it's the quantity that we use to measure our value. But I'll tell you that thousands of years of evolution has actually led us in a very different direction. It's actually to value quality more than quantity. And if you had the choice between having just one or two good friends who you felt you could be yourself with, who would show up for you in a crisis, who you would show up for if they were having a tough time. That is the key to feeling connected, to feeling like you belong. It's not having 500 people who maybe connected you online but may not recognize you. You know, if they saw you in the, in the cafeteria, may not know to check on you, may not be someone you can turn to if you're having a rough time. So in this way, I think I, I just want Everyone here, if you just left with one thing, to just remember that you have the power to actually help address loneliness in your life and the life of other people through this simple act of checking on one another, checking on your friends, checking on your classmates, checking on students you may not know well, but who might be alone. And when you check on them, you're not just sending them a message, you're actually reminding yourself that you have value to bring to the world, that you can forge a deep and meaningful connection with another human being. Right. Absolutely. And I really think that kind of the flip side of that coin is what we're doing right now and having open discussions and open conversations about mental health because 
you know, 40 years ago, this, this would have been a really taboo subject to discuss, and the fact that we're um, have, able to have these open conversations now, and I'm able to, as a future medical professional, uh, speak to my personal experiences having ADHD, OCD, and anxiety, um, and not be looked down upon, and that I actually can use that as something that can allow me to be more effective in my, in my field. And I remember when I first became Miss America, feeling like people wouldn't take me seriously because I was so open about my, my mental health struggles and that people would see me as less than who I actually was. But I was so fortunate to hear from so many of uh, the people that I would speak to that they experienced similar things and how much it meant to see public figures using their platforms to speak about their personal experiences. And so I think that that's another poor and really incredible part of the conversation is just being open and transparent and being able to see yourself in somebody else is enough to make you feel like you're not alone. I remember um, last year, last semester, I had to take two weeks away from school. Uh, I had experienced a very difficult period of anxiety and depression to the point where I was experiencing very significant suicidal ideation. So I had to go home to Alaska to be with my family uh, while I started my antidepressants. And I came back and I remember, you know, a couple of my coworkers were like, hey, where were you? We missed you. Um, and I was, a little bit timid and nervous to be honest with them about what was actually going on, but I did open up and I, I was shocked to find that many, many of them also have been diagnosed with anxiety and depression. A couple of them were taking the same, the same antidepressants that I was. I was like, oh my gosh, we're both taking Prozac. Hey, that's crazy. Mm. Um, so it was thing, those types of conversations and those types of connections that you can build with your peers really can allow you to feel like you're not alone and to feel like you're not an outsider. So that's another incredibly important part of this conversation that we're having is just taking away that stigma and making people feel like their emotions are validated and that their experiences are valid and that it doesn't have to be a horrible thing. You know, every experience, good or bad, is a notch in your belt that can allow you to connect with somebody else, that can allow you to be a more um, well-rounded human being. So I really appreciate that, that you're bringing this platform across the country. And can I just say, I just want to appreciate just how much courage it took to be vulnerable and to be open. And, and that's actually, I think, such an important message for everyone here, which is that when we are honest about what we're going through, that's not a sign of weakness. It's actually a sign of strength. Exactly. It's courage to do that. And as one of my mentors taught me a long time ago, she said, you know, when you stand in strength, you allow others to find you to see you and to be inspired as well. And I can imagine that there are so many people who heard you talking openly about your struggles and probably thought, oh, maybe I don't have to be ashamed about my own struggles. Maybe I'm not alone. And that's the power of what any of us can do by being open. I was curious to also ask him, during, look, I think when you became Miss America, obviously it was a huge source of pride for the ASU community, for your family, for for so many people in America, including the Asian American community. But I also imagine that there may have been an element of that experience that may have been isolating as well. And I was curious if you could speak a little bit to whether or not that was the case, and how did you deal with any of the loneliness that came with sudden fame and recognition? Yeah, that was absolutely the case. And that's the interesting thing about um, Miss America is that it's the definition of overnight fame. You know, one day I was just a normal ASU student attending my biology lecture in a lecture hall of 400 people. The next day, I was on the red carpet at the Super Bowl with Shaquille O'Neal. And it was, <laughs> there were so many, it, it, was, it was crazy, that, that transition. And being in a new hotel room in a new city every 24 to 48 hours by yourself, it was very isolating. And that was when my, my depression and my anxiety really started to ramp up. But the hardest part was that I was, there was a lot that people expected from me as Miss America. You know, a lot of people put me on a pedestal and they expected perfection. But, you know, I was only 20 years old. I didn't have many life experiences and I didn't quite know how to handle it. And I will say, I didn't have very good coping mechanisms. And that's why I had such a big blow up after I returned to school um, is because I never, you know, I kept saying, oh, I should, I should probably go see a therapist. I should probably um, 
you know, find some good coping mechanisms for my stress. But I kept putting it off, I kept putting it off. It wasn't until, I think, February, and that would have been two months after I'd given up the title, that I had this extreme episode where there were two weeks when I didn't sleep, I couldn't eat, I lost 20 pounds, and I was stuck in this episode of derealization and depersonalization, and it was so terrifying that I really, truly thought that I would have rather been dead. And that was when I'd... And that was the turning point when I realized, okay, I need to do something about this. But that was why I realized it's so important for people to realize that they're, they're not alone in their struggles and that it's okay to reach out for help sooner. You don't have to wait for that breaking point. And in fact, you shouldn't wait for that breaking point because especially these days, you know, our generation and people my age in college, we have so many things to think about. We've got work on top of school, on top of thinking about what we're going to do after school. You know, we're going to go to medical school, a PhD program. There's just so many things to think about, and so you don't necessarily have the time to take two weeks off school and stay at home with your family while your Prozac kicks in. Mm. So it's so incredibly important to address these things head on, and that was the mistake that I made when I was Miss America, and that's why I've been um, so insistent on preaching this, preaching this to the choir, which I'm sure everybody already knows, but attacking these problems head on before it really becomes an issue. Well, I'm so glad you shared that with us. And one other thing I just want to underscore in what Emma just said, which is um, I think sometimes from the outside, we have this notion that fame is all upside. It's what we should all strive for. It's a definition of success. It really is a mixed bag, right? And one of the things that I, I do worry about is that there's a lot, I think, in society that pushes us to believe that we have to be successful to be worthy, but define success as either being famous or wealthy or powerful. And ideally, you hit the jackpot and get all three. And then we write books about you, make movies about you, write you know, you know, articles about you. But I suspect that many of us in this room know people who are wealthy and famous and powerful and are profoundly unhappy. I certainly do. But I also know many people who have none of those but are profoundly fulfilled in their lives. And the, the common denominator I see between the people who actually have found fulfillment in their lives is that they have built meaningful relationships in their lives. Not a whole lot, but a few. Family members, friends, colleagues from work, folks from their faith organization, from their neighborhood, people they can rely on and be themselves with. Just I'm curious, just out of by a show of hands, how many people here know somebody who's struggling with loneliness or isolation in your lives? Yeah, it's almost everyone. I'll tell you that I ask this question everywhere I go in America. The response is exactly the same. Almost every hand goes up. This is our common struggle, right? And I know there's a lot of stuff we're reading about in the news, right, on a day-to-day -day basis of what's wrong with our healthcare system, what's wrong in other parts of the country, what's wrong across the world. But I do want to say that these social connections we're talking about, this is the foundation on which we build everything else. If I have the fanciest decorations in my house, the best furniture, but the foundation is fundamentally broken, that house is going to collapse. Right. And that is what we are actually witnessing happening before us. So we have a chance to strengthen that foundation, and that's one of the reasons I'm so glad that we are here today. And, and that's a, the good news is that I want people to feel not just aware about this subject, but to also feel empowered to know how you can make a difference. We talked about the power of simply checking on one another, but I'll also tell you that another powerful lever we have for strengthening our connections has to do with our attention. Our, if we imagine, like, just curious also, how many people have been in a conversation with somebody where you knew they were distracted? They were on their phone, something else was going on, right? Yes, I have too. And I will admit, I'm not proud of this, I've been the person sometimes who's on their phone and I'm talking to somebody else and then I feel bad about it afterward, right? We've all done this, right? Because it's so easy to just pick up our phone. We're just, it's almost a habit, right? Just check your inbox, look up the scores on ESPN, if that's your thing, that's my thing. Uh, you know, look up something on the news. We do this, right? But, uh, you know, in a, in a time where we're all like struggling to figure out how to add that 25th hour in the day, I will tell you that our attention actually has the power to stretch time. 
If you spend just 10 minutes talking to somebody else and you put your device away and you give them the benefit of your full attention, you look into their eyes when you're speaking to them, you actually listen to what they're saying and respond to what they're saying. And if you just do that for 10 minutes, that can feel extraordinarily powerful, more powerful than an hour of distracted conversation, right? right? And that is one of the things that we actually have to get back to. So if we can spend a few minutes each day checking on other people, if we can give them the benefit of our full attention, right? those are two simple but powerful things that we can do that will help us strengthen social connection in our lives. So on that note, um, how do you think that we can strike a balance between leveraging tools such as social media for positive social interactions, but avoiding their negative uh, impact on loneliness, mm. especially if, you know, with these college age students when a majority of our interactions with our peers is via social media? Yeah, I'm glad you raised this because this, this comes up all the time in my conversations with students, the, the topic of social media. Um, how many people feel like you have a complicated relationship with social media? Yeah, it's not so simple to manage. Um, and similarly, when I talk to students, like almost everyone says the same thing. They recognize on the one hand, sometimes through social media, you hear about events that are happening on campus. You can stay in touch with old friends, maybe from high school or earlier in your life. Um, but it also can be the case for many people uh, that social media can actually dilute the quality of your interactions can make you feel like you're constantly comparing yourself to other people online. Uh, and you rarely come out of that feeling better, by the way. Uh, when you're comparing your average days to everyone's best days, that usually doesn't work out for you, right? And, and we've all felt that. Uh, so that culture of comparison that's accelerated on social media, uh, the exposure to often extreme content, uh, you know, can also leave us feeling drained uh, and not feeling good about ourselves or about other people. And also the nature of dialogue online is just fundamentally different from in person. Like many people find that they're exposed to like hateful dialogue and exchanges uh, where people don't seem to respect each other or they seem to be so much vitriol online. And that can be really exhausting, even if you're just reading it and not participating in it. But a lot of times we would never talk to each other that way in person, right? Like the, the medium itself has changed and in some ways broken our dialogue. I do want to say, though, that if you find yourself struggling to manage with social media in, with some of these negative effects that I'm talking about, I don't want you to think that it's your fault or that it's somehow because your generation is just fundamentally born with less willpower than prior generations. That's not what's happening. You have just as much potential strength and willpower as any generation that preceded you. but What's different is the environment. I didn't grow up with these tools, and many, many of your parents didn't either. If I had had to contend with social media when I was in high school and middle school and in college, I would have been a wreck. And knowing my own personality at this point, at the age of 46, it would have been very hard for me to manage. And the platforms are actually designed to maximize how much time you spend on them. Not the quality of the time, not the positive impact on your mental health, but the quantity of time that you spend. That's what drives the revenue model. And we know from psychology that the best way to stimulate your continued engagement is to stoke anxiety and fear, hands down. That is the easiest way to do it, right? And so it's not surprising that that is what the platforms end up doing, serving up content to you that keeps stoking fear and anxiety. So if you find yourself using social media and not feeling as good, about yourself or the world or your friendships later on, you're not alone. And it's not, again, a reflection of you being broken. This is one of the reasons why in May, I actually issued a Surgeon General's Advisory on social media and youth mental health. Because we do have a fundamental problem where I now believe that the experience of social media is actually driving much of the mental health concerns that we are seeing among youth. And again, it's not to say that there aren't some positive effects, but if you've got some positive effects and you've got a massive amount of negative effects, right, that balance isn't where we need it to be. Right? And it's not so easy to just draw an arbitrary line. But here's what I, and, I, and so I've actually found many college students, I was just in Texas 
Uh, I was in Washington a few weeks before that. Like, so many students are telling me that they are just taking a wholesale break from social media because they're finding it's very difficult to navigate some sort of happy medium here. So, so this is really, uh, really difficult. But a couple of things I might suggest to you if you're thinking about, well, if you're thinking about taking a break, I think it's a very reasonable thing to do. And I would actually encourage you to talk to your classmates and your friends about this because chances are many of them may be in the same boat. And maybe taking a break together is actually much easier and more manageable to do. The students I was just talking to in Texas who took a break, I said, what did you see that was different for you after you took a break? It's very interesting. They said in the first few days it was hard. They were a little jittery because they were so used to being on it all the time. But they said they found that they were actually spending more time in person with their friends. Second, they found that they had more time because they hadn't realized just how much of their time was actually going on social media. Uh, and the third thing they noticed is that they actually felt better about themselves because they weren't constantly comparing themselves to other people. They were living their lives more on their terms. And so I think that's a, re a very reasonable thing to try. If, you're not, if you can't take a wholesale break, I think one other thing to consider is to say, can I pick a few times in my day that I will make tech-free zones? And that could be the hour before you go to sleep and throughout the night uh, where you protect from technology because we know that quality of sleep and quantity of sleep are so important for your mental health. It could be the time when you're together with other people, having dinner in the cafeteria, having a meal or catching up or taking a walk with friends. That could be time that you also make a tech-free zone. Um, wherever that time is, it's important to have, for us to have that break uh, so that we can just let the noise around us settle. You know, I, I've had many times in my life where I have just felt like there is so much noise in the world from all the news that I'm reading, from the social media that I'm consuming, from everything that sometimes you can't even hear yourself think. And sometimes you get so used to it, you just assume, oh, this is just normal. But sometimes it takes having a little break to realize, wow, there is so much more out there than I thought. There's so much more inside me in terms of ideas, reflections, peace than I had realized before. So all this is just to say, this is not easy to navigate, which is why I'd encourage you to, to talk to each other about it. We need to have a dialogue about how we manage social media in our lives, because we're all struggling with this. We, none of us have figured this out in our entirety. And until we have what I called for in the advisory, which is real safety standards for the platforms that protect us from some of these harmful effects and that are actually enforced, just like what we did for cars, Back in the day when we realized there was a high level of motor vehicle accident related deaths and we needed to get safety features in cars, until we put those safety standards in place, then I think we've got to continue uh, ourselves to draw a line and sometimes take a break uh, because it's our mental health that's really at stake here. Absolutely, and I think kind of tying into this, uh, this last question that we just discussed, now we're gonna dip into our audience questions that have been uh, submitted by some of the audience members here in attendance today. This question asks, um, how do you rewire your brain to allow yourself to put health before your job? So this person had worked for a company for years that did not prioritize physical and mental health in their employees, and so they're looking to see how they can um, really ensure that they're putting their mental well-being before work? Oh, gosh, it's such an important question. And look, a lot of us didn't get here overnight to a place where our, our mental health and well-being was third, fourth, fifth on the priority list, right? We got over over years of sort of being absorbing messages from society that told us, hey, if we're not successful at work, then we're not worth anything, that we're not useful, that we're not meaningful. And so this takes time, because what we're talking about is, this isn't an intellectual realization. This is a deeper realization that we have to come to at an emotional level. And as a society, it's a cultural shift that we have to make. What we're fundamentally trying to build are people-centered lives. People-centered lives are ones where we put people first in terms of where we, what we, where we prioritize investing our energy and our time, right? We, when our friends in crisis, we show up. When our family member needs something, we do everything we can to be there for uh, them. When we need something, the people in our life show up. That's a people-centered life. What many of us have now, and what society has pushed us toward, is a work-centered life. Right? 
And it's not that work isn't important. Work is very important. It's a huge source of meaning and contribution. But it turns out that when we are more connected with one another, we actually are better at our work. I realized this the hard way. You know, when I served as Surgeon General uh, the first time under President Obama, I made a really big mistake, which is that I told myself that I, the job had to come before everything else, and I neglected my friends. And even when I was with my family, I was constantly distracted. I was checking my email, I was keeping up with the news, telling myself, I need to know all this, be connected all the time, because my job requires it. And over time, you know what happened? I got lonelier, more isolated. That contributed to me feeling more and more burned out. And at the end, when my time in office came to a close, I was left without any community, including the community that I had at work. And it was profoundly isolating. When President Biden asked me to serve for this second term, I went to my wife, Alice, and I said, you know, he's asking you know, if we'll come back for a second term. And she looked at me and she said, what's going to be different this time? And she didn't mean, what, what are the issues you're going to work on? That's not what she was talking about. Is it COVID? Is it mental health? That's not what she was talking about. What are you going to do differently this time around? And I had to make a decision then and say, you know, I've got to learn from that mistake. I've got to build a people-centered life. And it starts with staying connected with my family and with my friends. But to Emma's question, I knew it wasn't going to be easy to do by myself. So I actually made that explicit commitment out loud to my wife, to Alice. I had two really close friends who I pulled in, uh, my friends Sonny and Dave, and I said, I screwed up before. I want to get it right this time. Can you hold me accountable here? Can you, can you remind me when I forget or when you see me slipping that I really want to put people first in my life? And so they have. There have been times where they noticed work was creeping a little too much into time with kids or with Alice or with my parents. And I said, hey, I think we got to rethink the balance here. And I was like, oh, yeah, that's right. Let me make some shifts here. So all of this to say that it starts, step one is just giving ourselves permission to prioritize our social health and well-being. Number two is to recognize we can't do that alone and to reach out to one or two trusted people in our life to tell them what we're trying to do and ask for their help in supporting us on that journey. And if we do that, then yes, these changes are possible. And I'll say one, the third thing you could do is just to be open about that journey with others. Because the truth is, when other people hear you're on that journey, it may inspire them to make shifts in their own life. Because a lot of us are struggling with the same thing, feeling like we're running faster and faster and faster on a treadmill that only seems to be going up and up and up in terms of its settings. But the question is, are we getting to where we need to get? And a lot of times, if you haven't been able to cultivate and build the healthy relationships in your life, you may run a long time on that treadmill. You may collect a lot of trophies and accolades along the way. You may have some time where you're famous. You may have some time where you make some money. You may have some time where you're in a position that has a lot of power. But at some point, it's going to feel empty if you don't have people in your life that you can share that with, who can be there for you and who you can be there for. Right. That's a wonderful point. Now, this next audience question kind of ties, ties into what we just discussed. Um, and it is asking, According to studies and statistics, there are people who avoid mental health assistance when they are in need of them. Um, and from your experiences, can you speak about what you see as potential barriers for seeking mental health and mental health help? And what would you advise to people who are kind of on the fence about uh, seeking help? Yeah, look, I think there are some common barriers. One is sometimes knowledge about where help exists. Second is the ease of access to that help. And the third is the shame and stigma that surrounds uh, mental illness still. And look, I think it's important for universities, workplaces, for, to make it like, as clear and as, uh, and as understandable as possible where help is available. Where can someone go if they need counseling 
where can they go if they're in the midst of acute crisis right now and it's off hours. Um, that's really important. Making it easy to access is also critical, right? If you have to you know, jump through many hoops and wait three months and drive 30 miles to get help, that's, that's hard, even if you know where it is. Um, but it's one of the reasons why you know, it, we worked hard over the last couple of years to set up 988, that crisis line. So just like 911, which anyone can call an emergency, people now have 988, and millions of people have used 988, by the way, over the last couple of years. Right. Um, so ease of access is important. And the piece around stigma and shame is, is just still uh, critical to, to, to state because as much progress as we made, a lot of people still feel ashamed to pick up the phone and to ask for help or to tell a friend or family member that they're struggling. And I think when you hear Emma's story, when you hear the stories of so many others who have courageously have been open about their struggles, my hope is that you will realize in those moments when you're really struggling and you feel alone, my hope is you'll remember this conversation and you'll remember, no, I'm actually not alone. I know it feels like I'm the only one going through this, but there are a lot of people silently struggling as well. We have become so good at wearing masks and walking around as if everything is A-OK. -okay. We're good at doing that online. We're good at doing that in person. But the reality is behind those masks. And it's okay to put that mask down every now and then and to just be real. I know that that takes courage. I know it's not always easy. But every time you do that, you will inspire other people to do the same. You will help them see, oh, I'm not alone in these struggles. And so that's a journey that we're all on together. But those are some of the things I see as really common barriers to getting help, all of which I believe we can address. Absolutely, and I will say before we wrap up, Arizona State University mm -hmm. has a host of wonderful mental health resources. There's a 24-7 crisis line that you can call, and there's free counseling services for all students at ASU, which is huge. And I will say, I mean, I've taken, I've taken advantage of ASU counseling services plenty of times in the past, because personally, my insurance is kind of hard to find somebody that's in network. And when I was really struggling, I was able to get free resources from ASU, and so I would really encourage um, any ASU students who are in the audience to take a look at those resources because we really have a great, wonderful um, array of mental health resources for our students. But thank you so much for being here. We are so unbelievably honored to have you here at Arizona State University. And thank you again for utilizing your platform for good. This is such an incredibly important topic. And we appreciate how much you're investing in the younger generations in order to create a brighter future. So we couldn't thank you enough. No, I so appreciate that. And I, I just am so glad to be here. And you know, one of the things we wanted to make sure we did during this time together was make sure we didn't just talk about the problem, but shared some concrete steps we could each take in our day-to-day -day lives. And, and I want to leave you actually with one of those steps in the form of a challenge, actually, that we are putting to every college campus that we, that we uh, visit. And it's something that we call our five for five challenge. Many of you may have this postcard at your seat. Uh, this describes that challenge. There's a QR code on here also that you can use to get more details on the challenge, but here's what it is. The five for five challenge is challenging you to take five acts of connection over the next five days, one a day. And that could be either expressing gratitude to someone, extending support to someone in your life, or asking for help. One of those three things. And each day that you do that, you can actually use this postcard to just record how you feel. And then if you go to the, the QR code, you'll also find our website, surgeongeneral.gov slash challenge, where you can actually share how you felt at the end of this challenge and tell us uh, what it meant to you. And to make this even easier, we're actually going to do the first day today. We're going to do it right, uh, right here, right now. So now uh, we're, here's how we're going to do it. I want everyone, and we're going to actually do this by using technology for good, OK? <laughs> This is part of the challenge, right? And it came up in the session. How do we use technology to help us, not hurt us? So take out your phone, OK? And I want you to just hold it in your hand for a minute. I want you to think about someone that you're grateful for in your life. It could be somebody who 
helped you last week. It could be somebody who showed up a few years ago when you were having a really tough time and they reminded you that you weren't alone. They reminded you that they still believed in you. It could be just somebody who did something big or something small for you. But think about that person. And just by show of hands, how many people have someone in mind? Almost everyone, great. Now I want you to take the next 30 seconds or so, and it's short for a reason, so we'll actually do it together. And I want you to write a text or an email to that person. And it could be a single line, but just tell them that you're thinking about them and why you're grateful to them. And when you're done, I want you to turn the flashlight on on your phone and just hold it up. So I'll give you 30 seconds to do that. seconds and just look around at all the lights that are up. Each one of these lights represents a ray of hope, a ray of connection that's gone out into the universe. Someone is going to take out their phone, check their inbox, look at their text messages and see this beautiful message that you sent them. They're going to feel seen. They're going to feel like they matter. And it's going to be because of what you did in these 30 seconds. So over the next few days, I want you to do this, the same thing, over the next five days, and see how you feel. Every time you reach out to someone, it's like dropping a pebble into a pond with ripples of goodness and connection that go out and reach them. And as we bring this time to a close, I just want to say that what we've talked about today, the power of human connection, this is really the defining challenge we've got to address during our time. It's a defining challenge. You know, I know so many days we wake up and life just feels overwhelming. You look at what's going on in your own life, you read about what's happening in the world, and it feels like a litany of challenges. Sometimes it doesn't feel like there's hope at the end of that tunnel. But one thing I know for sure is that when we are alone, then sometimes even regular day-to-day -day adversity can feel utterly overwhelming. But when we are together, when we know that there are other people who have our back, that we can take on all kinds of adversity together. We can weather almost any storm out there. This whole effort to build a more connected life this is not about transforming all of us into something unnatural or different. This is about returning to who we are, to our true nature. To where thousands of years we evolved to be connected to one another. The people who built trusting relationships, those are the people who survived, who shared their food, who protected each other around the fire at night from predators. But that old African saying goes, if you, want to go f if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And we evolve to go together, to be interdependent. Some of this is going to be about us unlearning some of the messages that we've absorbed over years from society. Messages that tell us that our worth is dependent on fame, power, and wealth. Messages that tell us that we have to be independent at all costs, which means we should never depend on anyone else or need anyone else. So that's a source of weakness. It's not. So that's the journey that we are on. What I want for you more than anything in the world is to lead lives 
fulfillment of deep joy, where you feel you are growing, you are serving, and you are loving as well. That only happens if we focus on the relationships in our lives. So this is a journey we're on together. You're not alone in that journey. And just remember some of the things that we talked about today, the power of checking on someone else in your life for just a few minutes a day, the power of giving people your full attention, the power of remembering that it's, quanti it's quality and not quantity that matters, that a few good relationships are more important than hundreds of, of connections with people who don't really know us. If we keep these close to our heart, if we make building social connection a priority in our lives, if we commit to actually talking to each other more openly about social connection and how we really build community, then as hard as these times may seem, we will come through this stronger, more unified, more fulfilled than at any point in our lives. And there's nothing more that I could want for all of you than that. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.